Uh, and welcome again to another Skeptics in the Pub online. So more and more of our local groups are opening up again now and people are trickling back into meeting up in person. Some new groups have even started uh, looking at you, Leeds. So do look up your local group. We'd love to see you there. Meantime, for everyone who can't make it in person and for those who can, we're still meeting here twice monthly with our excellent lineup of speakers. Uh, one important subject to mention is that if you don't already have tickets for the Skeptic event of the year, QED, it's happening on the last weekend in October. You can get tickets for it online. If you can't afford tickets, we've got a hardship fund you can apply for until the 15th of August. And equally importantly, if you've got a few bob you can spare, donations will be very gratefully received to help the people who can't afford it. For either, go to sitp.online forward slash QED. So on to tonight. We have the bioarchaeologist tonight, Brenna Hassett, who will be talking to us about a long-term view of the evolution. Now, I love finding out what the topic of people's PhD theses are, because they're usually so niche. And Dr. Hassett's is no different, in that hers was in dental archaeology, which I now understand is a really important field. Her fieldwork has taken her to many fascinating places, including Greece, Turkey and Egypt. She's a scientific associate at the Natural History Museum. And amongst other things, she writes regularly for Cosmic Shambles, a blog there called Dirty Science. You might also want to check out a project she's involved with called Travel Blazers, which promotes women's involvement in science and specifically archaeology, paleontology and geology. We'll be putting links to this in the chat. We'll also be putting links in the chat to where you can donate to help with our running costs and also to Slido, where you can ask questions for the Q&A after the break. So please put your virtual hands together very loudly for tonight's speaker, Dr. Brenna Hassett. Thank you so much for that. That's lovely, thank you. Um, well, uh, I guess we will dive right in because um, I have a lot to get through. It's a very long evolutionary history and um, hopefully we've got time for it all. Uh, hopefully everyone's interested because this is about you. This is about the evolution of our childhood. So first things first, what exactly do I mean child? I'm going to take a perspective on this, that a child is basically an animal that you are investing in, which is a proposition anyone in the animal kingdom should recognise, especially humans. So what I'm talking about is childhood as a period of investment before you become an investor in and while you're still soaking up resources. And the things I'm going to kind of cover are essentially how we make that investment, how we invest in our childhoods, because the way humans do it is really weird. Um, you may have suspected that human childhood is weird, having gone through your own. So childhood um, is a period of investment for all animals. And you can invest in different ways. You can invest um, in physical investment. Embodied capital would be the fancier way of saying this. Um, and that's, you know, the calories in for growth, um, the, the physical agility and skill. Um, that's all embodied capital. There's social capital, which is the sort of networks of relationships and support that social animals need. You can see this lovely picture of crows. And crows are, of course, very social animals. And crows, unsurprisingly, take a long time about their childhood because they need a long time to learn the role, uh, you know, how to live in a society that is literally called murderous. And then there's material capital, which is something that only humans seem to have learned to exploit, which is things that leverage into other things. But these are the sort of background investment ideas that we're going to go through when we talk about what we're doing with our unbelievably weird human childhoods. So let's think about investment in a sort of evolutionary biology sense. How do you invest in the next generation? Um, what we do in evolutionary biology would be use a life history framework. So life history is the milestones that you go through as an animal. Um, and in this case, we're talking about reproduction, gestation, birth, dependence, growth, and of course, cycling right back to maturity and reproduction again. So these are all the different periods of life that we can make investments. 
And what really matters is where you choose to put your money down because there are choices. You can invest very differently depending on the type of animal that you want to end up with. So um, gestation, how long you're pregnant for is a very good example. Do you want to have utterly useless, eyes closed, ears shut babies that you have to literally sort of, you know, wipe clean all the time? Or do you want a lovely, charming baby that is ready to run across the savannah? This is the difference between something like altricial kittens and precocial giraffes. So those would be the overly scientific terms for dependent and non-dependent animals. And that, you know, is just a question of how long are you going to cook those animals for? Uh, infancy we can choose very different types of investment. Some animals, spiders for instance, don't really have an infancy. They just are born ready, off they go. Mammals all have an infancy because we need to grow them with our special adaptation, milk. That's how we invest. There's the period of growth. How long are you gonna let that animal grow for? Do you want it to be big? Do you want it to be small? Um, and when are you going to make the critical switch to reproduction and maturity when that animal starts investing in the next generation? So those are different types of investments that you can make to get a different type of animal. And a lot of what kind of life history science has um, looked at is how those different choices build a different kind of animal and what it says about the environments that they may have evolved in. So for instance, spiders, which, you know, a spider will have a thousand babies, they all parachute off on their little silk strings, um, but not a lot of spider babies make it. So that's a kind of shotgun approach to reproduction where there's not a huge amount of investment because not so many of them make it. On the other end, would be something like a human who is going to invest extremely heavily in their baby because they expect that baby to live long enough to pay for their retirement. So something called R versus K uh, life history. So something that's sort of determined by your risk of dying versus how fast you can reproduce. And something that people have suggested reveals a sort of adaptation to either dangerous or more stable environments. And as you can guess, it's it's the guys with the shotgun approach who are in the, the dangerous environments. So what does this mean for humans? What is it about humans that has made us the very strange animal that we are? And we are very strange animals. I will go through this. Um, but very specifically for humans, one of the things we want to do as anthropologists is to look at our closest relatives, the primates, and to kind of look at the choices we could have made, the choices that were available to us on our sort of evolutionary tree um, and other, you know, close relatives, and which ones we didn't choose to make. And we can do this at each of these life history stages. So if we start almost at the beginning, making a human baby investing in reproduction, this is something that animals do, uh, but it's something that humans do weird. A lot of mammals are sexually dimorphic. They're different sizes. Mammals particularly tend to have larger males and smaller females, except for hyenas, which are weird in more ways than I can get into here. But those size differences tend to go along with competitive mating. So the males have gotten slightly bigger, like this charming fellow, this male um, Hamadri Hamadri's baboon, um, with his enormous fangs for displaying fighting and generally taking a chunk out of the competition. His teeth um, are something like 400 times the size of a female baboon's fang teeth. So that's an investment in his physical body in order to sort of, you know, improve reproduction. Humans are just not that dimorphic. I know, I know you've seen, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of images of, you know, um, males and females throughout your life and been told they're very, very different compared to other species. We are super same. Um, there's not a lot of size difference. There's not a lot of what we call sexual dimorphism. That suggests to us in the past that perhaps uh, we were not going for the full on male on male competition like Mr. Baboon here. And the second thing is very unimpressive genitals. That is a human feature. Um, when you have a competitive mating strategy in the primate kingdom, one of the ways you compete would be through sperm production. And this 
course, is going to have a knock-on effect on something like the size of your testes. Also, um, mate competition seems to encourage sort of flagrant adaptations to the penis, which include uh, the os baculum, which is the penis bone, um, differences in length, and things like penis spikes, which our species does not have, but other primates do. Compared to other primates, human genitals are just super tedious and super boring and suggest a fairly non-competitive approach to mating. If we were a uh, mouse lemur, for instance, this is the mouse lemur who has um, some of the largest testes for body weight uh, in the primate kingdom, I think the largest, um, male testes would be the size of grapefruits each. So we also have a series of female genital adaptations and um, for mating. So things like concealed ovulation, where you don't really know when a female animal is um, able to get pregnant. In other primates, this is a very big and obvious deal. There's reddening, there's swelling. And in our species, we seem to have decided to pretty much hide that and the jury is still very much out on why but it may have something to do with the fact that our species is also very keen on social sex they seem to enjoy having sex for reasons other than reproduction there are only a few other primate species that really put as much effort and of course the famous bonobos who are, um, they look like chimpanzees but they're not chimpanzees have some of the most um interesting relationships. Uh, but um, these are all adaptations that suggest to us that our, you know, our physical bodies are really not the bodies of, you know, apes who are out there competing for mates. And that tells us something about the societies that are, of course, going to produce our babies because reproduction takes two and two people as a society. But we have primate lifestyles, shall we say, that include a huge variety of ways to live. So you have solitary animals like orangutans um, who happily hang out. The, the most orangutans you're ever going to see together is pretty much two, and they don't even like that. Um, we have pair bonding like gibbons. We have um, everyone's favorite for example, the silverback gorilla and his harem. We have multi-male um, polygyny, so that's um, males mating with multiple females, usually like a dominant male, chimpanzees. Or we have polyandry, which is a dominant female mating with multiple males. So there are many options that seem to have been available in our clade. And which one did we pick? The boring one. And the weird one. Humans tend to form pair bonds. This is incredibly weird. Only about 10% of animals form pair bonds. And that's way, way less if you don't count the birds who are super, super uh, committed. 5% um, of mammals form pair bonds, um, but 15% of primates. And it does look like primates have a couple reasons that they might want to have a pair involved in the creation and perhaps care of the baby. One of the theories for why we are a monogamous species, and you can make all the reality show jokes you want, but we actually are reasonably monogamous compared to other animals who allegedly pair bond. We don't really have that many suspicious, that's not your daddy type of births. One of the theories is that um, having a pair bond means that male monkeys uh, won't come marauding into a new group of females and kill all of their babies in order to um, re-impregnate them with you know, their own genetic material so that it would be protective against infanticide because there'd be no motivation for the male monkeys to kill their babies if they knew you know, they were uh, the dad does suggest a level of awareness in something like a red TD monkey who has, you know, a, a head smaller than an orange um, of paternity, which is something that not even humans always grasp. But there you go. That's the theory. 
Um, another theory is that uh, males sticking around has a lot to do with females that don't stick around, that female wandering is something that might be behind males having to basically chase around a female. So if a female has a large territory and wanders it, um, if the male wants any hope of finding a female, he's going to have to follow her around pretty closely and she's going to have to tolerate that. And one of the things that we do know that um, monogamous monkeys offer is another pair of hands. And I think that's a really interesting, <laughs> really interesting part of this theory because it gives us basically an insight into an entirely new investment vehicle called dad. And there are certainly species, mostly at the bottom of our family tree, so the small little guys like the marmoset and the TD monkey here, who um, basically are, uh, you know, full-time carers while their, um, you know, their their babies are small because they can, well, they tend to have things like twins, which it turns out one monkey is not very good at carrying. Um, so you actually do have. Um, dads that appear, um, possibly as part of this investment strategy that's this long pyramidal sort of scheme leading back from our strange, uh, strange, strange sexual competition, our strange social organization. But it might all be basically a way of investing more in that baby. Investment is, I think, what it's all about. So we come to the next stage, next hurdle in getting a human. Um, and you, it is a hurdle. And this is the problem is that human pregnancy is incredibly dangerous. It's stupidly dangerous. Other animals do not have the problems that we have being pregnant. We, you would think that, you know, evolutionarily being able to reproduce your species is an important hurdle to be able to sort of go past. But we we seem to have caused ourselves considerable problems. We not only have a much lower chance of pregnancy compared to other primates, um, we also have extremely dangerous pregnancies. So the way that our placentas are structured essentially means that the baby can um, demand food on tap a little bit better than other animals. This ability to demand stuff from mom it turns out is very difficult on mom's body and causes conditions like pre eclampsia, gestational diabetes, that can literally kill the mother. Other animals have not decided to give their babies this kind of leeway. And we come to the sort of biggest problem with birth, which is we're not really built for it. Um, the little diagram you see here, the gray circles are about the sort of space in a pelvis. The dark gray circles are the space for the baby's head. And you can look at the human diagram and see exactly where the problem is. We have very risky births that frequently end in disaster. Um, and we have a harder time of it than even our closest living relatives. This is something um, that has been explained evolutionarily as the obstetric paradox, is that we are a species dedicated to big brains. We have these highly demanding babies because they are growing expensive big brains. These take a lot of calories to build. However, we also want to walk upright. And to walk upright, it's been said, you know, you need a stable pelvis. It needs to not be so wide. It needs to be sort of a different shape. And this is going to be where you get problems. So we do have a solution to this in our species, which is that we actually allow the baby to twist on the way out because otherwise none of us would be here stuff would not work out. Most monkeys sort of slide out the way they're facing. Uh, human babies make a little twist in the birth canal and come out facing sort of sideways most of the time. Now, this is something that we have sort of looked at and seen even in our fossil relatives, um, like Lucy, um, who would have been one of our first upright walking fossil relatives, and said, Ah, this is how we adapted so to this obstetric parent to solve the problem of big brains and walking hip. However, recent observations, chimpanzees who have no problems space-wise also. So we're still 
very, very much in the process of working out why we have such difficult babies. But one of the answers might lie in things we see like ethnographic food taboos, and things um, where people will say, oh, pregnant women shouldn't eat too much meat, shouldn't eat too much dairy, because you'll have a baby that's a little too big. We can grow babies that are way too big. And that seems to be what the general problem is. And of course, the question is, what kind of baby are we even going to have? Um, humans are still primates. Um, so we actually do seasonally breed. If anyone is particularly concerned that they are overly surrounded by Leos and Virgos, you are not alone. Um, especially as you get into the sort of further latitudes, north and south, there's a much stronger effect of sunlight. And sunlight, of course, uh, changes year, you know, around the year. The effect is stronger, and um, the farther north or south you go, and um, sunlight is also, of course, what determines seasons, and seasons determine food availability. So for a lot of animals, including some of our primate relatives, seasonality is a big important part of life because you want to time a baby perfectly correctly in order to take advantage of the most food available for when that baby's going to need it the most for that for that sort of gestation and birth period when you're going to need to invest in that baby the most. Um, so uh, you can see that it sort of actually shifts, I've highlighted in red, the, the frequency of birth sort of shifts as you go farther north. And um, of course, us being humans, we are, um, you know, very much keen on setting our own evolutionary path. So we have our culture to thank for the fact that there are so many Leos and Virgos, not just seasonality, because we decided there's Christmas, there's New Year's, and that means there's a lot of babies born at a very particular type of year. So this baby that we have, it is big. It is very expensive to build, and it is totally useless. And that is the thing that I think is really interesting that sets us up for this, this childhood that we're going to have, because we um, sort of, we actually spend a huge amount of calories. If you think of everything as sort of how much does this cost in terms of food I have to eat, we spend a huge amount of calories. We spend most of those calories, though in pregnancy and we spend far less of them in sort of nursing and the sort of infancy period, which means that we have babies every two to four years. Someone like an orangutan who spends a good seven to eight years nursing their baby has about, unsurprisingly, six to eight years between births. So one of the ways, if you wanna be a very successful great ape, one of the ways to take over the planet would be chop down that birth interval so that you can have more babies. So our entire investment strategy sort of causes some very human problems. And I think a lot of people, if you've ever encountered small children, um, will be aware of this. But our cultural adaptations really do have a very strong effect on how we deal with them. So, um, you know, uh, people may be familiar with the idea that even how you give birth is very different. Depending on uh, I think it's something like 16% of cultures where people um, give birth semi-reclining or in a hammock. I did not know hammock was an option uh, until doing the research for this book. And we also have um, things that do affect the actual health of our babies. So, um, for instance, breastfeeding, which every other mammal does with really no major issues whatsoever. Um, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life, which is kind of the minimum uh, that people recommend. Only about 1% of people in the United Kingdom are able to achieve that. It is an incredibly low amount. So we obviously have things that are culturally interrupting um, whatever the, the sort of um, earlier trajectory of our lives. But because we're humans, we have come up with ways to deal with this. We domesticated species in order to get milk that we could feed, okay, not just to babies, but to everyone. Um, and we can see this uh, in the archeological records. So 
I am an anthropologist who does a lot of archaeology. So I'm very interested in childhood. So there's a lovely 3,000 year old baby feeding bottle that we can see. We can find, um, you know, traces of uh, sort of weaning foods and things like that that existed in the past. And of course, there are things like the wet nurse trade, which existed for a very long time. This is a dramatic depiction of an 18th century wet nurse so that the posh lady is handing over her child to a, a hardy peasant type outside of Paris who will be able to nourish the child in a healthy, non-urban environment, um, which was very common for sort of the upper middle classes in the early modern period. And it was also very common for the upper middle classes 5,000 years ago. We have in these are human solutions to the problem of doing the thing that we were going to do anyway. Very human solutions, I should mention. This is my favorite childhood object in all of archaeology. This is um, a seventh century, very posh training potty from the Athenian Agora. It was excavated by a series of men who looked at it, couldn't work out what it was. And uh, one of the female excavators came up and said, Oh, I know what that is. They did try it. The first child is wearing a nappy and could not successfully demonstrate. But um, the second child uh, is Miss Elizabeth Crabb in 1937. I think she's past caring about this picture now. But um, she, she did successfully use the 7th century reconstructed Athenian Agora potty, um, which is should tell you more about archaeologists probably than uh, humans. But what I really want to talk about is our childhood. And our childhood is a physical phenomenon that we have made a cultural phenomenon. So just like we have human problems uh, that we've in, sort of introduced with our culture, we have sort of human solutions. So humans grow slow. Our period of being invested, our period of just even physically growing is longer than our other primate relatives. This is a chimpanzee off to one side and a human. And you can see that, um, for instance, the shoulder joint where the chimpanzee is um, going to eventually finish off its growing bones, that's going to be finished in the chimpanzee skeleton around nine to ten years. For um, a female human, it's more like 15, 16 years. And for a male, because males are always a little bit slower, it's going to be a little bit more like 19 years. So that's a huge difference in how long it takes to grow up, even in animals that actually aren't that much, sort of that different in terms of weight. Um, and this is sort of the tools of my trade. So what I do as a sort of anthropologist is to look at the physical remains of, um, you know, people from the past and our ancestors and look at uh, what they can tell us. And one of the things they can tell us is um, how they were growing. So your bones change over time, as you may have noticed, children get bigger. And the way they do this is fairly straightforward. The skeleton, especially the long bones, you know, the arms and legs that have to lengthen, um, they start off as little sticks, and then they've got little ends that slowly screw down. So by looking at bones, we can actually see where the bones are in the process of finishing. So we know what an adult bone looks like and what they should look like in various stages. And then of course, we have teeth. And I do have a PhD in dental anthropology, so this is my specialist subject. I can talk all about teeth, but I'm aware that not everyone enjoys that as much as I do. Um, someday I will write a book that's just teeth. But of course, if anyone's ever been a small child, you may recall, you start off with one set, it falls out, you get more in. Um, many of us have dealt with the joy that is wisdom teeth. So we actually have schedules in the physical body that we know essentially, you know, uh, when things happen. We know certainly when things happen for us and our living primate relatives. And the interesting part is taking these schedules and comparing them to our evolutionary history, because this is how we find out how we got an incredibly long childhood compared to our other primate relatives. We can look at the fossil record and see what was happening in other species that we think contributed to our line. 
And the problem is, of course, that we need to find still growing um, fossils. And it's incredibly rare to become a fossil. You need to, like, die in a mudslide. It's very helpful. Or, you know, get taken into a cave very undisturbed. But essentially, it's very difficult. Um, our, our record is very patchy, um, but we do have a couple fossils that are incredibly helpful in uh, basically teaching us how we grew in the past. So going back two to four million years to Australopithecus africanus, we find the Tong child. Um, and the Tong child is pictured here with an eagle because there are three little depressions um, by the eye sockets in the top of the cranium where uh, a little eagle may have carried off this poor little Australopithecine um, to its doom. Uh, but one of the great things about the Tong child is that we can see the dentition. So we can see the teeth using that knowledge of the schedule of development of teeth. If it was a human, we could say that Tong child was about six years old. It's at the same stage of growth. We can also look at Nariokotome boy, also known as Turkana boy, um, who's a Homo erectus, so a little bit more recent, sort of. Uh, one to two million years um, and we have both the skeleton and teeth so we can actually look at where the bones are still growing you can see the femur here has you know still lines from where things are still fusing and closing and for a human at this stage we could say okay um, this would be 11 to 12 years old well great we can put them in a relative chronology but how do we actually narrow it down in this this is my special science. This is the record of your growth locked in teeth that allows us to basically construct a fossil clock. Your tooth is a fossil. It grows once, it doesn't remodel. And when it grows, little lines form. Your little cells make these beautiful little lines that actually appear every 24 hours. So every single day you grow, someone like me can slice open your tooth, polish it down, sand it, put it on a slide, look at it under a magnifying glass and start to count the days of growth. Happily, we can also usually find a big fat line that signals a particular trauma called birth and we can count from there. So we can actually get an age in days for how long your tooth took to develop. And that gives us an absolute chronology that we can actually balance the sort of how, when your teeth are coming out or when your skeleton's fusing and this allows us to recalculate the ages of these hominid species. So Tong child, a human at the same stage would be six years, but if we count how fast the teeth were growing, it's actually only three years. So it was growing much faster than a modern human. It was growing on much more ape-like trajectory. For Turkana boy, Narikotome boy, the real age was probably seven to eight years and not 11 to 12 years. So it was also still growing quite fast. We also have suggestions that potentially Neanderthals were growing just a little bit faster. It seems to be about the bottom range of what humans are doing, so it's very confusing. Jury's still out. But what we can see is that our species has a very long evolutionary history where childhood just got longer and longer. If we compare ourselves to the other primates, um, we just have an extraordinarily long period of childhood. So we end breastfeeding early compared to other apes, and we have a much later first birth. Um, so uh, around 21 years, and that includes the past. People do not just instantly have babies at 15 in the past. This is like some weird thing that people are obsessed with saying. Very few societies have ever had uh births that early and those that have have really not had very successful results from it even chimpanzees and other great apes wait a while after hitting sexual maturity before they actually start reproduction because nobody trusts uh no nobody likes that the other thing that we have that you may have noticed is this this is the period of life the adult period that goes beyond female reproduction. We have females that are no longer reproductively active for almost half their lives. And that is incredibly weird. It doesn't happen. It's not, grandmas are utterly suspicious. 
other species. Other primates don't have them. Your matriarch of the elephant herd still has menstrual cycles. Chimps still have them. The only other animals that seem to stop actually reproductively cycling are some whales and us. And that is incredibly weird. Now, of course, being anthropologists, we do have a theory to explain it. And it goes back to investment, that the grandmother is able to invest not just in a new baby, but in the same baby that the mom is investing in, doubling up the investment. We had dad doubling the investment earlier, and now we have a grandmother. So this is potentially one of the ways that we are supporting these incredibly expensive long childhoods. And what are we doing with these childhoods? What, what is it that we are spending so much money on? Uh, or if not money, you know, at least time and effort. Um, well, we have the infancy sort of period, so where um, the infant's still being directly cared for, either breastfed and fed directly, um, which is, you know, uh, when the infant is learning, um, usually just from the mother and other caretakers, uh, things like what to eat. And then we have the period of childhood, which would be, you know, once the, the baby's sort of a little bit more mobile, can get out there, and that's when for primates particularly, this is when your big social group becomes important because you have more people to learn from. You can learn from the expert nutcracker. Um, you can learn and play with your peers. And then we have older children who, who do a lot of location and do a lot of transmitting knowledge to their friends. So um, my favorite with this are, are the macaques. So Japanese macaques are just crazy and they live in all sorts of places and do all sorts of things but one of the things they do is apparently in the 1950s um there was a group of macaques that lived to um, a series of hotels and uh, the hotels someone was provisioning them someone was giving them food and so they kind of hung around the hotels and one of them fell into a hot tub fell into the hot tub and decided that this was the excellent excellent activity and rapidly taught all of its friends and uh, relatives to fall into hot tubs. And this got so extreme that eventually they were all moved to the hot springs where you can now take photographs of them. Um, and the same thing happened with um, macaques that were begin being given sweet potatoes is that some clever macaque decided that um, actually if you dip the dirty sweet potato into the nice salty water, you get the equivalent of an unfried sweet potato fry. But these are all behaviors that were um, sort of discovered by juveniles and then transmitted through their societies. And that childhood learning is really exceptionally sort of emphasized the particular period that the great apes seem to excel at, and that is adolescence. So adolescents, what are they? They are learning from their peers, and in a lot of cases, they're moving groups, they're moving around, and they're in slightly different social groups than the rest of the group. So teenagers um, hang out with teenagers, but we are not the only species that has teenagers. Uh, there are essentially gorilla boy bands, other, lots of other primates, um, in order, especially the ones with very competitive uh, social systems, actually, they, uh, in order to cut down on murderousness, once you have a bunch of male animals who, you know, are technically grown up, but not really socially able to, say, reach the top of silverback status, they will go off and essentially form their own little boy bands. And you get gorilla bachelor groups, you know, that may last for several years. So, these structures seem to be, um, well, they take some pressure off the main society, but they also seem to be how a lot of new skills get transmitted between groups, which I think is very interesting because, of course, adolescence is the thing that we are stretching out the most. So we're using this childhood to basically play and learn to be a better monkey. And human play is particularly interesting because uh, like chimpanzees, like other animals, our play is very much decided by the society we live in because it's going to help us join that society. It's going to prepare us for the role we're going to play in that society. So chimpanzees who are murderous and bonobos who are fun, um, you can guess which one of those plays more. It's the bonobos and who plays later. Uh, bonobos. And um, you can see in human societies that uh, there's very different kinds of play depending on the social role that kids are going to have to grow up. So there is more gendered play. So more girls do this, boys do that. In the children of farmers where gender is more important in social roles, 
um, than in foragers, people who are hunting and gathering. And there's much more time given to play um, in the children of foragers versus, say, farmers. And these are all things that basically determine, you know, um, what role you're going to go grow up, you know, how you learn to, to fill your role in sight. And unsurprisingly, they really are different depending on what society you're in. And of course, there is another type of childhood. There is a, a type of childhood play, which is not necessarily play at all. Learning to take on your social role uh, for a lot of children might include contributing to essentially work, contributing to social life. So um, it gets harder and harder <laughs> to, to sort of contribute the more complicated your structure for getting food is. Um, so forager children might be able to provide about 50% of their own calories just through their own actions, um, you know, by the time they're five to seven years old. Farming children the same age still need adult help to process food. You could cut down a lot of maize, you could collect a lot of maize, you could carry it, but you still need a lot of people involved in the process to sort of, you know, um, denature it and to, to make it edible. And then, of course, we have wage labor in societies where food is bought um, you have, you know, an entirely different set of circumstances. And we do definitely see that as soon as we get economies that uh, demand wage labor, we get children who have to work. This is the 2,000-year-old shoe of a child from um, who worked in the salt mines of Hallstatt uh, in Austria. And also from the same site, we have, um, you know, a lot of evidence from burials of children whose bodies are extremely strained, stressed, that have, um, you know, the actual pathologies of carrying heavy loads, of really hard physical labor, and of course the fact they died young, to tell us that um, when we get economies with sort of wage labor, we are really dramatically seeing the difference that investment can make in parents who can afford to invest in their children and keep them out of these sort of stressful situations and parents who can't, the difference that that material capital is making. And of course, there is play that becomes extremely specialized. We call it training. When we start to get these incredibly specialist roles in our societies. So when we start to get potters, we start to get... <laughs> People training children to do terrible pottery, like this um, Sinagua pottery from prehistoric Arizona. Um, we get, you know, uh, religious training is a very big thing for children in the past. There are some girls here pictured on the uh, wall paintings from Thera, that's the, the preserved city on Santorini, um, picking saffron, probably for religious reasons. And possibly my favorite ever child's job in the past, I don't know that it was necessarily nice to do, but it is hilarious, which is managing date-picking baboons in uh, New Kingdom, Egypt. So here's a little scrap paper where someone has kindly drawn an utterly unlikely baboon and has spots. That's, that's not a thing. Um, Baboons don't have spots, but uh, it was apparently a suitable job for um, very elderly men and young boys to essentially manage these baboons that they train to, to go up and, and pick dates. So play sort of elides into training. And of course, there is one type of training that becomes almost ubiquitous, especially in our modern societies, and that is education. Now, of course, Education has existed for a very long time, and certainly we've been learning for longer than we've been a species. But the very formalized education, where um, you know now we all look around and think that we all need it, um, but would have been the privilege of the very rich in the past, is something that uh, has existed for a very long time in our history. So this this is one of my favorites. This is a 4,000-year-old um, tablet. Uh, it's an Akkadian kid who's going to Sumerian school. Um, so uh, it's like learning Latin. Sumerian was, you, you needed to learn it in order to be scribed because everything was written in it. Nobody actually spoke it. And um, this poor kid, it's, it's, a, it's a standard text. There's quite a few versions of it. But he sort of, he recounts his day and he says, oh, I've got to, you've got to wake me up. Um, if I'm late, the teacher will cane me. And then, uh, you know, he, he has, uh, ask, ask his mom for his lunch. His mom gives him lunch. And then um, he ends up being late and he gets caned. 
And then uh, he turns in his homework. Something's wrong. He gets caned. Um, the teacher, sort of looking for people to sort of pounce upon, um, notices his shirt is untucked, gets caned. Um, he talks out of turn in class, gets caned. Um, he uh, puts his head down when he shouldn't have, gets caned. He uh, leaves the classroom. Uh, oh, no, he fails to stand up. Um, he gets caned, leaves the classroom when he wasn't supposed to, gets caned, um, and then, uh, you know, spoke out of turn, again, got caned, and then finally, his handwriting. Terrible. He gets caned. To be honest, after that many canings, I think we were very impressed that he could write it all. But you can see that the sense of this poor Acadian child is very much something that would be recognisable today. And we have now, of course, extended this opportunity for education to a lot of people. So let's just sort of rehash how we're investing in childhood. And you really have to think, we have extended our childhood for a huge amount of time beyond other animals. We have 20, 25 years at least to grow up. Um, that's the same amount of a bowhead whale. A bowhead whale, however, is going to live to be 200 plus years old. So we are living like we are living, you know, like we are 300 year old animals, but we're not. We have just stretched our life history so that we can fit more and more investment in. And we fit it in gestation and infancy where we're shoving in the calories um, and doing sort of physical training. So that embodied capital, we do it in childhood and adolescence, where we're making social relationships, where people are learning from each other, uh, playing with each other. And of course, we do it with our material capital, where some children get to go to Sumerian scribal school and some children go down the mines. And I think that is the question that remains for us. We have this incredible long childhood and we are stretching it out with our ability to give some children you know, the, the chance to train the, the bank of mum and dad to fall back on, um, you know, who's going to pay for your rent or your food while you do an internship? Who's going to make sure that your student loan payments don't go overdue? These are all things that, you know, are social decisions that we are making on top of the physical evolution that we've already made. So for some people, it's perfectly fine to get to 40 and still be mildly economically useless, ask me how I know. But, you know, for others, you've got to go out and work and it's not an option to extend training or delay adult social status. And I think that is the question as a species we've got to think about is why is it that I can do a degree till I'm 30, but for girls in Afghanistan, they've got to leave school at 11. These are all social decisions, but they are deeply tied into our human desire to evolve an epically long childhood. So I will just leave you with a tiny little tiny little um, side note, which is my, my side project, Trailblazers. So Trailblazers are on all the social media and we have the website and we are a celebration of women who do archaeology and anthropology and geology, paleontology, anyone who's ever dug. We love you and we know that you've been out there um, for far longer than people think. Our first entry, I believe, is St. Helena, um, actual saint, you know, third century. She, she dug up the true cross. It wasn't the true cross, but that's not important. She tried. So we collect stories of women who have worked in these fields. And if anyone ever wants to tell us about uh, women we don't know about or share memories or, or just look at these amazing life stories, please visit us and um, see what we do. But otherwise, I will just um, leave you with that. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. I'm not sure whether I was more personally interested in the grandmother hypothesis because everyone suddenly finds they need you when they decide it's time you were available, or the fact that when we were in Margate recently, thinking about the teenagers, it was fascinating that they were separate, whether they were just even more annoying than ordinary seagulls, which I love, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. there's so much to think about there. 
Um, in fact, if you have questions, please go to sitp.online forward slash ask and ask those questions. And while you're there, uh, vote up the ones that you like and the ones whose answers you'd most like to hear. Uh, before we finish, next week, we've got Daphne Joel. Dr. Daphne Joel, and she's going to be talking to us about rethinking sex, brain and gender beyond the binary. So that one looks really, really interesting. So uh, we will be back, you know, in 15 minutes time, at uh, five past eight. So top up your glasses, visit your privies, and we'll see you here at five past eight. Thank you very much. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, and I hope you're all suitably refreshed and uh, ready for what looks like it's going to be a really interesting Q&A. So I'll dive straight in and I will ask the first question for, from Paul Picticule. He asks, is there any evidence that children brought up in a commune with multiple parents develop differently from those brought up in a more conventional manner? Ooh. Well, that's very interesting. And I'm going to have to say that um, I don't actually know. <laughs> That's that is um, so. I'm sure that there is um, lots and lots written on the subject that I am just not aware of. The thing that I do know about is probably more um, what we call allo parenting in different types of primates. So allo parents are substitute parents. They are your aunties, your you know uncles who aren't uncles, your you know all of these people come into life of a child and help invest in it. So allo parenting is something that all human societies are very, very big on. Um, and of course, it would probably depend very much on the situation, uh, what kind of interaction uh, the children were having. So I imagine it's quite varied, but I'm sure someone has done some fascinating research that I just don't know about. Um, the next question is completely different. It's from Igor, who asks, and um, we're stretching your imagination here, I think. Is there some kind of visible ongoing trend in human evolution? Can we reasonably predict what we'll look like in the future, assuming humanity has one? Um, well, that's, um, let's be optimistic. Um, I think there are there are all sorts of things that people say, and obviously um, the wonderful thing about humans is we have culture, and culture we sort of take and beat our evolutionary history with a stick until it's the shape we want, and that's the wonderful thing about humans is that we get to sort of change these things. Um, one of the suggestions so I talk a little bit about this in a, an earlier book called Built on Bones. If anyone's very interested, it's more dead people in archaeology. Um, but uh, I talk about some of the changes that have happened in our bodies in sort of recent human history. So things that aren't making us a different species, but things that are sort of physically changing us would be different lifestyles, different levels of activity. So all the people who sort of um, sort of settled down and farmed have essentially much, well, they have skinnier legs because they're not building up muscle that's building up their skeletons and sort of, you know, we can see changes in the sort of physical um, robusticity of different activity patterns. We can also see it in our faces. Um, so one of the things that's happened over the last sort of 15,000 years is our faces have got smaller. Um, our jaws in particular have got smaller, possibly due to new foods that we eat and uh, or maybe just a preference for small jaws. Um, but as you may have noticed, your teeth have not gotten smaller, which is why we have so many problems with wisdom teeth. They no longer fit. Uh, so we might imagine in some sort of, you know, continuing these trends to a ridiculous degree that we all essentially end up looking like little grey aliens from, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of cartoon version where we just have tiny, tiny little jaws. We don't need any more of our hair. And we all, because we all live in space or something, and we have big giant eyes. <laughs> so I think there are trends. Um, where they will take us is anyone's guess. So can I just ask you about the about those changes? You, so the, the legs, I mean, I can see that the jaws may be a, different, a, a genuine evolutionary change, but say our kids so from tomorrow all had to live the lives of our ancient ancestors and suddenly had to, uh, needed much more muscular legs maybe and bigger jaws, would they get them? Is it possible or has evolution made it, have we actually changed our DNA, do you think? Well, the problem is, um, is that we're always taking, you know, 
um, this group of people with skinny legs and this group of people with big, big, muscly legs and assuming that they all lived at the same time. And of course they didn't. What they did was take those muscly legs and take those skinny legs and pass them down. So it's something that uh, we can't instantly assume all the forms that our ancestors might have had. But probably within lots of us, there is the sort of potential for people to be more or less successful at passing on genes, depending on which ones work best for our societies. So um, while you could probably bulk up considerably <laughs> with, with a lot of activity and exercise, um, it's not going to make the kind of population level changes, which is, which is what we're looking at, because we're looking at these stupidly long stretches of time when we're talking about changes. I mean, you can go back in Mesolithic and find someone with skinny legs. Right. So a simple answer to Igor's question is little grey aliens. Yes. Right. Um, got a question from Kat now, um, who asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the idea that human babies are born early, not because of size constraints, but because of the en energetic costs for the mother of a long gestation? So this, this is a very interesting theory, and it is something that I think has a huge amount of potential um, it also fits very well with the kind of idea of investment. So we have particularly difficult pregnancies because we have these placentas that are essentially allowing the baby to demand on-demand service. You know, it's, it's very baby-led. And this is because our babies need a lot to grow. They, they need these expensive brains. They need these sort of, you know, um, expensive, you know, they want to become big brained humans. So we have to funnel a lot of energy, but the mother's body can only transfer so much energy successfully. So at a certain point, and this happens in all animals where there's a certain threshold beyond which the mother's body just can't transfer enough energy to the growing baby um, to support, you know, both of these ongoing lives. Um, and there's an idea that that point at which you hit the sort of barrier where you just can no longer provide enough for the growing baby that the baby has to be provided for externally where you can give it more food or breast milk or whatever it is um that is the point at which birth happens so it's a very interesting idea and i think it, it does sort of fit very well with the idea of investment in terms of our f physical ability to invest in our babies that we just we want to invest so much that we've got to get them out early somewhere where we can start um, feeding them even more. Yeah, well, we certainly wouldn't, the heads, wouldn't want the heads to be any bigger, though, would we? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, next question comes from Skeptical Fella. And he says, are humans really that monogamous? And what jumps into my head at that is the 10% figure for um, genetic testing on that babies dads aren't their dads or something i don't know if it's that high but it's it's something it's quite, i think it's about 11 percent yeah so it's about right yeah and so it's, it's, um, are we, or he, he then goes on to say have we been for in our evolutionary history or are we monogamous or well i think so monogamy is a very difficult thing to define and it's you know you we've we've tried for many eons to have nice legal definitions and property rights determined by and, you know, divorce trials determined by. But, um, I mean, monogamy is, is obviously a sort of, um, it's a funny term that people use to describe pair bonding. And, of course, in a lot of animals, that pair bonding is not for life. It's for several seasons or it's for, you know, some period of life. But um, that sort of, um, the, it's slightly different from the uh, sort of paternity issue. And the 11% figure is actually dramatically low compared to other pair bonding animals. And it might be even lower if you think about who gets genetic tests. So if you are already testing for paternity, chances are good you have a reason to suspect that paternity is not yours. So we, we think that in some animals it can be that are ostensibly pair bonded, that it can be as high as for 40%, I think in some primates. But um, for humans, it's actually reasonably low. And That's it's lovely. much low. And it's much, it's much lower um, depending on the society. So um, paternity, uh, when sort of questionable paternity, seems to be much more of an issue where women do not have as much agency in choosing marriage partners unsurprisingly 
Um, but these are these are social determinants, not necessarily a sort of standard biological pattern. But I think a lot of people would argue that monogamy as a as a concept is a little too narrow for what animals, any animals, actually do. So actually, it's the definition of the word monogamy that we're getting wrong. We're, we're imagining that monogamy means two people stuck together forever. And that just is not what it really means. It means for the most part, on the whole, two people tend to get together for a while. Yeah, I think that's probably closer. There are probably some bird species that you could say, yes, monogamy, definitely. Um, but we are we are not albatrosses. So. That's a shame. They have all that soaring. They look yeah, quite fun. <laughs> um, they seem very committed. Um, yeah, except for when their babies drop off the nest. I saw a heartbreaking David Attenborough program. Oh, that's babies, barnacle, barnacle geese. They can't barnacle find geese. them. Yeah, that was, it's yeah, no, it's barnacle geese. That's a that uh, was a traumatic documentary. I also saw that. Yeah. The albatrosses are fine. The the dads sit there with the babies forever. It's great. All right. So okay. Well, it was a barnacle geese that that got me really quite upset then. <laughs> right. Yes, um, they very upsetting. So, Igor, uh, does the elongating human childhood have, have a positive feedback loop? Does it help humanity? He's really into long-term f- uh, future development, is Igor, because he then says, if so, does it mean we'll be perpetual children at some point? Well, I think um, you could you could ask, um, you know, what uh, what are various societies doing um, to either encourage or discourage these perpetual childhoods? And, and are more societies sort of extending that period of dependence or more societies clamping down on it? And it seems very clearly to me at least, that um, you know, more and more societies have things like um, uh, mandatory education. You know, you have to go to school till 16. You know, my grandmother's day was 11 or 12, depending on, you know. Um, and, you know, now many of us sort of live in societies where it's very difficult to, to sort of get a good job if you're not going to go to university, even if you never use your university degree. You need that piece of paper. You need that sort of to have had the social experience to fit in, um, which is something that is decided very much by society. So I think while there are certain places, and um, I mentioned Afghanistan, where you know girls now have to leave school at eleven, where that's not necessarily the case. I think in quite a lot of places, the agreement is that we should give children much longer. I mean, it used to be. Um, you know, seven or eight down the mines. That was, you know, that was a thing. Um, I'm talking about Hallstatt. I think it's probably 12, 13, uh, black country. But um, the, you know, these are social decisions. And I think if they are continually reinforced, then we'll just have to see what that means for our species. And there, you're talking about it being social. Of course, it's becoming socially more and more necessary now with people not being able to earn a living until they're too old to need to, you know, which which means that people be, are remaining dependent on family for much longer, even though they might not want to be. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I fall into the um, aged millennial category myself. I'm the generation that grew up and just went, oh, I can't earn a living. I can't earn a living doing this. So I did a PhD in dental anthropology, which did not help. But um, you know, this is this is very true that you know we have entire structures in our society now that are tilted towards people who can get that support mm. and tilted against people who don't have it. Absolutely, yes. And, and as someone who's been able to support my kids, you're constantly aware of this isn't fair. Yeah, yeah. and I think Being a lot of people the, the are aware other, of that. Yeah, I have millennial children. And yes, you, you every time you do something, you think, do you know what? What about those kids that don't have this advantage? And and there's, yeah. It's, so, yeah, life's unfair. Yeah. Anyway, well, so. And that's, another, that's another social decision. Yeah. Um, so uh, Kat again asks, uh, how common has it been for women to live a long time post-menopause? Are grandmothers an adaptation or do they have adapted benefits? So yes, so that's that grandmother hypothesis, and I think um, I think a lot of people would argue that grandmothers are useful. 
I think many of us in our own experience <laughs> would say that grandmothers are extremely helpful. Um, and I'm sure um, for women who have children and living mothers that uh, they would also agree that grandmothers are a really good idea. Um, but it seems to be something that is is very long term. It's very difficult to know when this arose in our evolutionary history. So we just have to kind of look at the role that grandmothers play in our societies and how you know we use them and how they exist and try and work out from there um, sort of you know when this arrived. But it does seem like having non-reproductive later stages of life has been with us for a long time. We certainly see um, you know down the human skeletal record into the you know sort of um, well beyond sort of historical past that we have you know skeletons of women who died at advanced ages. So, you know, we know that people were living a long time and um, we're pretty sure that the biology would have been very similar. Of course, when this arose, we were not quite sure. But the reason for it, presumably, we wouldn't keep having them if it wasn't mm-hmm. adaptive in some way because we've had them for a long time. Yeah. Um, and it, we, related to that, Dave Jenkins asks, uh, why has the grandmother hypothesis not occurred in other animals, if there can be a benefit to it? Um, well, it's sort of a balance. So if you have a baby that can survive without that extra level of investment, maybe you don't need to uh, shut off women's reproduction. Maybe it's more beneficial for your species for those females to keep on reproducing and to increase numbers. So we talk, uh, talked a little bit at the beginning about R versus K, which is not, no, biologists don't like this. It's not something that's like a, a sort of major, um, it, it's not considered up to the task of explaining the whole variety of life. But it is kind of handy to talk about when we talk about um, you know, some of the evolutionary choices. So if the big pressure on you is that um, lots of you are going to get marauded, lots of lots of the offspring are not going to make it, then you really want to maximize how many offspring you're having. If the pressure on you is how many sort of, um, you know, how much investment you can get into that offspring, then you're going to go a completely different way. So it might be for the vast majority of animals, you just want to not die. <laughs> but for us, up at the top of the food chain, we, we might just want to, you know, invest. Yeah, well, the, the amount of investing we're doing, we have to do in our children. It is a good thing that we can't carry on doing it. That, that would be my very simple <laughs> assumption. Um, we have a, a teeth question, a few teeth questions. Good, um, good. Do adult teeth show the birth line, Ed asks? Some of them. Um, so there are teeth that are growing while you're in utero. All your baby teeth. Um, growing in utero, but um, the very tips of your front teeth and a little bit of your very first kind of chunky chewing tooth, your first molar, um, usually might have that, um, it's called the neonatal line. Um, and it's been the subject of some of my research. But uh, you, so we can actually make that schedule of growth um, depending on, on which teeth of yours we find um, last for quite some time can sort of go go fairly far into childhood by counting those days you're making teeth actually sound quite interesting (laughs) they are they're really interesting so um somebody else who's anonymous asks uh do their teeth suggest anything different about neanderthal childhood compared to our own yes so that's um that I, i alluded to it a little bit There's been some very exciting work um, which involves taking Neanderthal teeth and dropping them into a synchrotron and hitting them with a very, very big beam. Well, it's very small, but anyway, um, compared to the type of scanning that I've been doing, it's very impressive. And that allows um, researchers uh, like um, Dr. Tanya Smith to look inside the tooth and get find those little incremental lines, those little 24-hour day lines. And so if they count up the number of days it takes to form, you know, um, a tooth, and then we compare it to how many days it takes to form the same tooth in modern humans, we see that the Neanderthal children that we find are down at the bottom end of that range, if not slightly below it. So the thing is, is that 
we, we have so few Neanderthal teeth, we might have just found the weirdos. And we have, you know, we don't really have enough idea of the variation as possible to say for sure that Neanderthals really were growing slower. But it is certainly a very interesting idea because, of course, we made it and they did not. And it's very tempting to read into this, you know, that some of our long childhood might have been responsible. We need to find some more dead Neanderthal kids, though. That is that is the agreement of all paleoanthropologists. <laughs> um a uh, skeptical fellow asks another question about teeth. He says, how is it possible to determine human age from teeth when we lose our milk teeth? So um, that that neonatal line being there, um, you know, is very useful for counting days. Um, and often in teeth, there are other scars. Um, so we, we use the scar from birth. Um, but there are other things that cause scars like fevers, um, other other sort of health events that we can sometimes match between teeth that are growing at different stages. So we can make a little step ladder and do our sort of counting up of days that way. And um, your teeth are actually forming um, the hard white enamel part that we use for counting are sort of you've got up to age 12 um, that we can sort of count days in. But it's actually very rare that we do that. Usually we would probably try and look at things like um, your dental development. So for anyone who's ever had a kindergartner, um, and I think it's a, I think it's sung in England as well, um, the all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. So the reason why kindergartners, you know, five-year-olds sing that is because that's when your teeth fall out. That's when your front teeth fall out. So we have this very well-known schedule of when teeth fall out, they fall out in the same order in almost all people, and they appear again in the same order. So depending on the sort of um, age of the individual, you'll have a different mix of teeth and mouth. And I can look at that and generally get within about six months just from the, the mix of teeth of, um, of about how old. It gets harder as you get older, and of course, once all of your teeth are out, then we have to start looking at basically um, wear and tear to assign age, and that is not nearly as accurate. Right. Um, Ed's asked another question, and I think the answer is straightforward, but I will see what you think. Is my pet a child? Um, unless they're contributing financially. <laughs> Are they investing in you or anyone else? Um, I, I think if you're investing in them, they're definitely, that counts. Oh, it does count. I have two grand dogs, so yes. They count. <laughs> yeah, they're the amount of investment that needs to be done, even when you didn't choose to have them. Yep. Um, and I love this question from Nadia. Nadia asks, does the image of storks delivering babies originate from birds of prey carrying babies away? <laughs> well, that's, that's mildly terrifying. I mean, I did mention this is this. Um, so bird predation is a huge problem for a lot of primates because, of course, lots of primates are small and there are some big birds out there. Um, so squirrel monkeys, for instance, have huge, that's their main threat is, is bird predation. Um, but uh, <laughs> I hadn't considered it. I will now consider it. <laughs> I think I think. Storks are generally less aggressive than your sort of eagles and other predatory birds. Um, the thing that has always uh, sort of um, caught my eye about storks is um, they, they live very close to human habitation and they, um, they nest and move around at certain times of the year. And as we may have discussed, storks live in certain latitudes where humans uh, might also have seasonal breeding. So a lot of the things that you might associate um, with particular turns of season might also be associated with particular trends in human births, um, which is another way to think about uh, sort of how we get some of the stories, yeah. the sort of folk myths. So even that though that story is more likely, a good size eagle could carry off an infant if it wanted, presumably. Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's uh, I think you know, a golden eagle or some of the eagles they have. So um, Tong Child was in South Africa and they have some very large eagles and they, you know, they're eagles that will carry up a small deer. So you can definitely, yeah, eagles are a problem. Right. Um, 
So staying with our, our Russian contingent, Igor uh, asks, uh, do you think we're approaching the age of genetically engineered humans? What feature of this new editable human are you most excited about? <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm really excited about the idea of genetically edible humans. I'm not sure that we are good enough at understanding what our genes do. Um, we have we have obviously made huge improvements, but I would not currently trust even my most esteemed colleagues in DNA um, and genetics uh, with with designing well. You know, a birthday card, let alone a baby. But no, uh, I think you know we can we can we can all agree that um, there's probably some fascinating technology that will eventually allow us to deal with harmful um, health conditions and things like that. And we already have things like genetic screenings um, that allow for some some sort of adjustments to be made prior to birth. Um, but uh, I, I don't think we're there yet. So the one thing I might recommend, if you can get the BBC uh, old in um, in Russia or anywhere else when anybody wants to watch it, is Alice Roberts did a programme a few years ago on designing Human 2.0. I can't remember what she, what it was called, but it was it was Alice Roberts on BBC. She came up with a really weird looking human being, but that's that's worth watching. It was fun. Um, we've got another question from Anonymous who said who asks. Um, that they, well, well, they say they saw some studies saying grandmothers matter, but not grandfathers. Are they really a net zero in child rearing? <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think there there are studies that um, have suggested that um, there is grand. Uh, there's a difference in grandparental investment. Um, again, these are things that are hugely socially decided. So. Um, it depends on the type of investment. Um, so if the investment is um, just food provision, um, then it might be that uh, grandfathers have a role that's sort of equal to grandmothers, depending on how food is got in that society. However, if it's something like, um, you know, direct care, uh, I think quite frequently it's grandmothers. So I think there are very socially dependent, very culturally dependent ways of investing. Um, I mean, if it's just sort of stories about um, going to school up a hill both ways in the snow, and uh, you know, those those are serious grand grandparent investments that grandfathers can make. Tall tales about you know how how tough it was back in my day, um, but I think um, it, slightly more seriously that there's a lot of ethnography. Um, that sort of suggests, I think, that it, that it is very mixed bag, depending on what the, the rules of society are. Yeah, I wonder if it'll be different in 30 years' time when you look at um, young men today compared to 30 years ago and, and their investments in childhood in general. They... So, um... I mean, yeah, I, I, I hope that, um, I hope that the, the trend for investment is, is something that uh, is a trend towards equality. Mm -hmm. the other way yeah um and Serda asks there are also differences about baby humans versus other primates do you think um if there is a do you think that, that if there is a particular do you think that if there is a particular selective pressure that would start this separation like so um, why, think, why why are we so different i think is there i think yeah and i think that um there's probably a huge number of things that that affect um, kind of how, what how we have these different babies from other primates, how we raise different children than other primates, and some of them are um, adaptations to different environments, um, different social groups. So there's all sorts of things going on in primate evolution um, that sort of compound into making us the animal that we are. So. Um, needing to eat different foods, needing to acquire those foods in, in different ways. So we have, um, you know, we have a lot of cooperative activities for getting food. We're a sort of pretty ground-based species, so we need larger groups. Um, Tree-based monkeys get away with sort of being pretty solitary. 
but um, nobody wants to be, uh, you know, just a solo monkey when the lions come charging down the savannah or whatever it is. Um, so there's all sorts of evolutionary pressures that have probably split off various behaviors and things um, things that are sort of we think of as as you know one adaptation have probably arisen several times. So things like um, pair bonding in primates seems to have shown up like four times, possibly for very different reasons um, in each little species that it shows up in. So there's there's a series of pressures, and they're all incredibly interesting. <laughs> Um, but I don't think you could you could point to one. I think the the one thing you could probably sort of um, subsume them all under the heading of is that we have we're sort of an animal that has a relatively stable environment and a very large sort of very social um, system social system, and uh, that we therefore um, want to take lots and lots of time to invest in our children because it's more important for our children to basically have the tools to to get along in our societies to learn the the rules of the world um, than it is to grow up fast and reproduce fast. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a lot of interesting thoughts there. Um, okay, Gray the Earthling now asks a really weird question about a type of being who I hope is vanishingly rare because he asks, is the stereotype, the stereotypical man, which I hope is rare, where a man goes from his mother's house straight to his wife's and never learns to look after himself, does he ever stop being a child? <laughs> um, I, I feel like there are several people in possibly unhappy marriages who could answer that question better than I could. Um, but I think it depends if, if that person is making some sort of contribution uh, is is not just a net sink for investment, but is also offering something. Then I'm sure there are uh, ways in which they would not be a child. But uh, it's possible that their wives would disagree. <laughs> yes, let, it's, yes. It's, it's new prayer, isn't it? Never let me never be that sort of wife. Um. Oh, we have another question from Gravy Earthling, who says, "How much influence do gender roles have?" on the effective length of an individual's childhood. I'm suddenly in Afghanistan when I read that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, no, they have a huge effect depending on, again, this is this is what humans do. We take our culture and we manipulate our evolutionary biology with it. So um, it matters. Um, I think it a lot of um, what you might think of sort of the end of childhood of sort of um, so for a lot of uh, people that might be having a child of your own, um, that was certainly not the only way to invest um, would be a slightly earlier age for women rather than men. And that's, that's vaguely true across a lot of societies that women tend to have um, their first birth sometime around 20 ish while men might be delayed by, um, some number of years, but again, that that is definitely determined culturally. Um, so, I think I think these are all very much society based uh, rules that we are adapting around. Um, there is some physical maturity that happens earlier, which seems to be a kind of well, it's a product of hormonal signaling. Um, and uh, as, as I once, uh, as I really like the phrasing that, um, you know, instead of thinking that, uh, you know, females shut off growth early in order to turn towards reproduction, we should just think about males kind of lagging behind. Right. I've just lost. Right. Sorry about that. I, I completely lost my way there. So um, Skeptical Fella asks, going back to the monogamy question. What about polyandrous societies and other unusual ones, less common ones? Or were you talking about monogamy from a separate angle than societal structure? So um, most human societies have something like pair bonding. And then there's quite a few that, that offer extra options. Um, I mean, even in polyandrous societies, they're actually usually quite structured. So they usually tend to be women can marry a succession of brothers, for instance, mm -hmm. um, or something like that. So while there are certainly um, 
many options on the human buffet table. Um, pair bonding does seem to be a, a fairly default setting. Yeah. If I was going to be in a polyandrous society, I wouldn't want to have to have the brothers. You'd want to choose, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> not many people will have allowed that option. Yeah, that, that's not good then. Um, <laughs> so, three-year-olds. Question about three-year-olds and evolutionary behaviour here. I missed some of the talk because my three-year-old was being a pain in the ass about going to bed. Any evolutionary explanation for that? Um, well, I uh, am keeping a bunch of doors shut so that my two-year-old doesn't hear me. <laughs> I have no advice whatsoever on sleep patterns in toddlers. One of the reasons for writing this book was because I was pregnant and then I had a baby. And so I was suddenly very interested in a lot of the questions about human reproduction and what to do with children. And it turns out everybody does something completely different, which is exactly what you're supposed to do, because humans have culture. And if we don't follow our sort of cultural adaptations, it turns out we aren't very good humans. So three-year-olds failing at bedtime is, I believe, perfectly culturally and evolutionarily adapted to being a modern toddler. Except so in another society, that wouldn't, hap that wouldn't happen, would it? If, if, if there were different cultural expectations about bedtime sale. Yes, one one of the noticeable things is I'm currently in Greece. Uh, I have very long period field work um, during the summers. Um, so uh, Greek bedtimes are not UK bedtimes. They are yeah. much later. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to give you a snippet of information that's going to horrify everyone. I, I'm Greek, uh, part Greek. And I was born in Greece. And you were talking about weaning foods. I don't know if they still do this, but the first food I ever ate was calves brains. <laughs> I just, I don't know if they still do that in Greece. It just, it, I was horrified when I learned that. But cultural ex, ex, expectations are just weird. Um, yeah, no, anyway. it was, um, it was uh, marrow soup. Um, I'm, I'm on the island of Chios, which is where, All right. and they, they suggest marrow soup. Um, they, yeah. Well, they don't do it anymore, but everyone um, sort of from the villages sort of says, oh, when I was a kid, I was given marrow soup. <laughs> yeah, the brains, brains brit kuru worried me a little bit. <laughs> mm. That was Athens, though. <laughs> more, more sophisticated in Chios. Well, or just we've got fewer cows. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got uh, the next question is we we'll hear more about if you can tell us a little bit more about them that would be great because skeptical fella asks a question which is traditional uh, he asks do you have any pets and can we see them oh well, you can't see them because they are in fact in England they are being lovingly cared for by our our cat sitter but um, as an archaeologist I think you will all be uh, terribly terribly impressed that I of course have two cats called Enkidu and Gilgamesh. So can I ask, some of us will know and some of us won't. Who were Enkidu and Gilgamesh? So um, so one of the things I work on is a sort of northern Mesopotamian uh, archaeological site. It's very interesting. And the Epic of Gilgamesh is the first sort of written fictional work. And it tells the story of um, the prince Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh. Who, uh, who befriends the friend. wild man Enkidu. Um, and they go off on adventures and have this wonderful, beautiful relationship and, you know, fight death and there's a flood. And it's, it's all very epic. Well, please give them our love when you go back home to England. And uh, can I just say, I, I absolutely loved that. That was fascinating. And I thought the questions were great. And, and I loved hearing what you had to say about them. Uh, so can everyone just go wild in the chat again? And um, the last thing I'll say is that don't forget, we have our virtual pub, the Lockins Razor. It would be great to see you in there. And it'd be lovely to see you again in a fortnight's time uh, for a talk about uh, Beyond the Sex Gender Binary. Bye, everyone.